There's no reason to have self-doubt. You can, you can change that. Whatever limiting belief you have from whatever past experiences you might have had, address that, fix it, and life just gets exceptionally better once you start to eliminate that self-doubt. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com, and the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. Hi, I'm Donnie Connor. And I'm Rich Vanek, and this is the Tom Roland Podcast. Fellas, what's going on? How you doing, Rich? Good, man. It's nice to meet you in person. I know. Nice to meet you. Donnie, how you doing? Very well. Thank you. Right on. Glad well, to be here. I appreciate you guys being on the show. What have you been up to, Rich? Oh, man, just uh, working. I'm currently out in Colorado. I'm, oh. I, I do live in the Keys, but we, we spend the winter months out here in Colorado goofing off. So mm-hmm. we're out here doing a little work. And, and Donnie's over in Arkansas, and we're just uh, trying to get this startup company off the ground and, you know, living life. Nice. Now, were you saying that you just did an event before we started recording? Yes. So recently did the, uh, the Modern Day Night Project. And I learned about the Kokoro event that you did mm-hmm. while we were there. I think some of the guys I went through that with, we were going to get together and try to do the Kokoro as well. Nice. So I'd be interested to pick your brain and see what that was like so I can kind of c- compare and contrast. Well, the let's there. let's start with what yours was like. I don't, you know, I'm aware of that. I know I, I follow a bunch of those guys on uh, like Ray Cash Care on Instagram and, and Bedros. I uh, follow him on Instagram. So I, I see kind of the 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 program a little bit, but why don't you tell me, having been through it, what, what it is and what you learned? So for me, it was, you know, I don't know if, if it was, um, if my business partner noticed that I was in a rut or if it was just divine intervention, I was not seeking out any kind of experience like that, but a buddy of mine called me a buddy and former business partner and said, Hey man, I'm going to do this, uh, retreat, this, <laughs> this like leadership retreat. You want to come check this out <laughs> with me and do it. And I'm like, yeah, sure. It sounds fun. It's pretty physical. You sure you want to do it? You need to start training. I said, yeah, okay. I'll start working out. You know, I was 25 pounds heavier before I, I went into this thing and, um, started training. And then they do these weekly zoom workouts where you get online with everybody that's going to be in your class and you work out with them. And at the first workout, I was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I might be in a little bit of trouble here. So anyway, I, I trained with it. I did push one class because I just didn't feel like I was physically ready. Um, finally got enough uh, confidence in my physical fitness that I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And along the way, I got to know Ray Cash Care, who you're talking about. Yeah. Just a great dude, man. Salt of the earth. Awesome guy. And uh, he's encouraging, but he's also very firm and doesn't let you get away with anything. I'm sure so, that's correct. Um, yeah, we did it, man. Yeah. And so how long is the, how long is the retreat? <laughs> so it's 75 hours, 75. And wow. The one I've done a 50 and a 48 hours. and, uh, that's, that's 75. So what, how's that broken out? 
there's only so much we're allowed to, to say. About oh, okay. It, right? They make us sign a little bit of NDAs, but I will tell you that it's uh it's physically demanding, but more so than that, like I'm 47 years old. I've been in better shape in my life. I'm in okay shape. I can do the push ups and I'm, I've got some strength cardio wise. I needed a lot of work, but it's more about being mentally tough than it is about being physically fit. You know, they, they have this saying that at some point you're going to come face to face with your inner bitch. They call it when you get there and you're going to have to decide if you let that, that thing win, or if you're going to bury it in a grave and you're going to move on and you're going to use the tools that they're trying to give you to address it. And, um, I tell you what, I went in really focused on the physical part of it, not really thinking about a lot of the mental Mm -hmm. and somewhere, somewhere around hour 40 or 50, you realize what they're talking about. You realize that you can get through all of this. If you just decide to that, no matter how hard it is, you can make some changes in your mind. You can decide, okay, this hurts a little bit. I got to crawl another mile in this pit. Or I've got to get back in the ocean and I'm freezing. I'm, I'm shivering like a jackhammer, but I can, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, and, and, and they teach you all these things. And then throughout this, there's, there's like a rhythm to this thing where you're, you're really high heart rate. You're working at a red line pace and then it calms down a bit and they'll put you in some classroom and they'll do some classroom training (laughs) and you're supposed to, um, be able to absorb this information. And what you don't know is the next day, some of that information Maybe you might get tested. You might see if you, they might check and see if you actually learned anything the next day. So it's just a really cool rhythm of things. And you, if you get through about half the guys that sign up for this, don't make it. So there's typically about 40 that sign up and 10 or 15 won't even show up on day one. Mm -hmm. They'll just ghost. You never hear Mm -hmm. from them again. Mm -hmm. Um, And then of the people that do show up, there's another 30% that drop out of that um, ring the bell or get hurt or something like that. But when you leave that, if you, if you finish it and if you leave it, it it really is just the beginning of this great brotherhood of all these guys that you went through this suffering with, you become a real community. Like my class, we still get on a zoom call once a week and chat and talk and we share business ideas and we brainstorm. Somebody else might've had this problem in business and this is how they addressed it to work for them. And they share that knowledge. So we've got this great community of men who are trying to be better humans Nice. Um, be better husbands, be better fathers. It's just a, it's just a great organization to be a part of. That's a missing component in the ones that I've done. I did uh seal fit Kokoro and, and <coughs> excuse me, and go rook selection and uh, successful in Kokoro and unsuccessful in, in selection. But once it was over, there was not a community afterwards. And it, it, I had to reach out to people that, that were really important to me. Um, and still are in touch with, with quite a number of them, but there's not a, not a community like that. That's, that's a really big deal. So what are the big takeaways that you took back to your personal life and your, your business life? You know, for me, it was, um, <clears throat> there's no reason to have self doubt. You can, you can change that. Whatever limiting belief you have from whatever past experiences you might've had, address that, fix it. And life just gets exceptionally better. Once you start to eliminate that self doubt, that was a huge one for me. Nice. Everybody's got something different that they take away. That was mine. Nice. Yeah, man. I, I, I took away some big lessons from mine and immediately applied them to my life and my life got infinitely better, uh, because of, of both of them. So that's cool. Well, you are, um, you do have a really cool business. And you're doing some really cool things, which was the which was the purpose of this podcast. Um, tell me about tell me about your business that that you're doing and what you're what you're creating. So Donnie and I used to work together, um, actually in the oil biz, oil and gas business, and we started designing products that would make the environment around those businesses safer, detecting H two S so guys weren't being exposed to it reading high levels on tanks so there wouldn't be spills, things like that. We wound up getting out of that business, but we kept that technology piece between the two of us. And we really wanted to do something not only to help people grow their businesses, but also that had a good, uh, a good governance to it, a good social impact to it. And Dottie and I were sitting on the back of his tailgate uh, on his pickup truck in Arkansas one day. And I had brought one of these valves with me that I used to sell, which feels like a lifetime ago. And um, I was t- talking to him about how the inside of the valve works and how they start to fail and what happens when they start to fail. 
I was like, man, if we could put a sensor here and detect this, and if we could read the pressure here, I think that would give a lot of value to the communities that, that have these valves. And Donnie is a, he's MacGyver when it comes to hmm. figuring out how to monitor just about anything. And he's like, I can do that. I can do that. So he, he runs in his shop literally and started fabricating stuff that day. Wow. And um, the first iteration of it that he made worked like a champ. Um, so I reached out to a bunch of my old government customers, you know, just cities and towns throughout the Southeast that we've done a lot of business with and said, Hey, we've got this really cool thing. We'd like to try. Do you have a problem with these valves in your pipelines? And it, of course, everybody has some level of an issue with them. Mm-hmm. And the Florida Keys, man, was one of the, the ones that jumped on it immediately. They, they started putting them in. Um, they immediately started recognizing pressure surges or uh, um, something, something from the valve that indicated it might start to leak. And they would go out and address that immediately so there was no environmental event. They were just really proactive about it buying them and now they started putting them on bridges like they're, they're they bought another 24 from us recently because they're slowly outfitting all the bridges and the keys with this product just to kind of excuse me to make so donnie what is what does this valve do exactly what are you what does it prevent how are you solving a problem well rich showed me this device and it's a air release valve and what this does is it it keeps certain pipelines uh or piping you know, infrastructures from building up a pressure that could cause pumps to either cavitate or, you know, or become, uh, become locked, Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, which can cause damage on the pumps. It can cause damage on the pipeline and, and, and other things like that. So, you know, with, with what Rich give me, I, I really didn't understand the whole structure of, his business on what it was doing with the air release. I just knew, okay, you need to know if you have a leak and you need to know pressures and we need to alert and control. And so that's where, that's where I come in and I said, yeah, we can do it. And, you know, like Rich explained, we were sitting on a truck and I think, I think in just a couple of weeks, we already had the prototype installed. And I believe that's in new Orleans, Jefferson parish. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were the biggest critics of our system than, than anyone. And we were kind of doubting ourselves at, at first because we were like, hey, uh, I'm Rich. I'm getting a I'm getting a vent detect on here. I think we got a leak. And Rich was like, oh, boy, I, I, OK, I'm going to go there and check on it. Well, sure enough, Rich drives over there, takes a video and uh, there is a leak. Hmm. And they were saying that that was impossible. Well, Rich brought out this group of, you know, big decision makers with that particular manufacturer. And they said, well, we're going to take this valve apart and this is going to prove whether your product is, you know, what it is. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they tore that valve down right there on site and, and we nailed it. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a, a great, great, you know, experience to, to have an idea like that, you know, yeah. come to life and, and be proven. And so the, the valve, uh, what, what kind of pipelines are you putting this on or what's it designed for? So we initially designed it. Um, so it, it goes on sewer lines basically. Okay. And yeah, every city in the country across the United States has hundreds, if not thousands of these valves. JEA, for example, has like mm-hmm. over 4,000 of these valves. They just, they're on every pipeline because you have to get the air out so that you don't have issues in the pipe breaks uh, or, or pump problems like Donnie was talking about. So we originally designed it for sewer to detect if there was going to be a spill that could be addressed immediately and you could limit the amount of spill that happened. Hmm. What, we, what we've learned since we started putting these in the field for the last two years is the guys on the water side are excited about it too because we can also take these little battery powered device, put it in strategic locations around the city and monitor pressure. That way, if there's getting ready to be a break on a water line, they'll see that before it happens and they can address it or at least reduce the, the, the amount of catastrophe that might be coming up. A water line or a sewer line? On both. Or is it you the can, same? It's the same. Mm, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so where, where, where do you have the, you said one in, in Louisiana and some in the Florida Keys. Um, are there any kind of, 
examples that you have of where this device could have could have saved um, a significant amount of sewage or 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 whatever getting into water somewhere or has it yet? You know, um, because we're detecting the pressure in the pipeline, there was an article in uh, Los Angeles Times last week or last month where a pipeline, a sewer pipeline broke and spilled eight and a half million gallons of water into the ocean and they had to close some beaches. Wow. I'm not saying that we could have pre prevented that catastrophic event totally, but if they had a system like this on there where they're monitoring different pressures at different locations, there'll be some indicators that come in that tell you there's something that's getting ready to happen. There's a phenomenon called water hammer with that, that can, where water can run back and forth in the pipe uh, and it can wind up rupturing the pipe. Hmm. This will tell you early on before that happens that that's going on and you can stop it from happening and eliminate that fatigue on the pipeline materials. And how would you stop that from happening? Like once they get, once somebody got this um, notification that that was going on, what, what do you, what would be the, the, the solution to, to keep it from rupturing? So if they, if they, if they recognize that it, it's different in every case, but if they recognize it's a water hammer problem, they can change how slowly the pumps turn off. So it ramps down. So there's not an abrupt stop in the a water column with a, a column of air behind it, where it sloshes back and forth. They can put in other valves, check valves where they, there's slow check valves where they slowly close the pipeline and they eliminate there's, there's strategies to eliminate that, but you have to know it's there in order to, <clears throat> you know, all these, all these municipalities are strapped for resources being manpower and also for cash. So they, in order to justify that end, they have to know that that problem is there. Right. Hmm. Yeah. It yeah. And do that. And so <clears throat> how much exposure, like let's just take the Florida keys, for example, how much exposure to potential um, sewage spills is there in the Florida Keys? You got 42 bridges, um, and I'm assuming that that one of those pipes that I see on the side of the the bridge is full of stuff that definitely does not need to get in the water. Um, <clears throat> is that is that where is that where these valves are going on the bridges? Yeah, that, that's where. So when we did the trial project with the Keys, they put one on uh, one of the bridges in the lower Keys. And within a week of it being on there, they noticed that there was something that there might be a potential leak coming up. Mm. So they drove out to the valve and checked it. And they, sure enough, there was a clog or something that was deteriorating inside of the valve. And they were able to take that valve out of service and work on it, put it back in before there was any kind of event where it might have spilled. Now, that spill might have only been a gallon or two of, of something. It might have been um, insignificant. But... There are cases where those valves do leak for 20 minutes at a time where they need to know that. Um, the fact that the Keys is being super proactive like this and putting these on the bridge crossings is, it's just really encouraging that a municipality is, is taking that step and being proactive. And then what's the, I mean, the, the potential for this is, is freshwater, saltwater nationwide, right? To protect the water? Yeah, absolutely. Any coastal, any coastal community. In fact, we have, we have some communities in Florida that are not coastal. There, there's plenty of these that just run under roadways in the middle of the town, but they have areas where the vaults that the valve were in might overflow into a neighborhood. So it's it's good for a lot of a lot of cases. But for us, the the the, the tie-in with the clean water, the fact that I live in the Keys, I love to fish, I love your show. You know, there's there's a lot that that we feel really good about by marketing these towards the bridge crossings in Florida because it just has a huge immediate impact. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when you're marketing these towards the municip municipalities and particularly when you were going to the Keys, like what are the like? Do you have any data on like <clears throat> what how much um, sewage might be getting into the water? with the existing system and why they would want to, I mean, there's gotta be some reason like that they're going to spend the money on these new valves besides just potential hazards, right? Like, is there, do you know of any data of, of these things have been leaking for years or they, they, they constantly leak or I don't know what, I don't know. Are they, are they safe? Is there, is there stuff getting in the water before you put the valves on? Like what's the current state of the, of the system now? <clears throat> before your before your valve the so the EPA keeps a, a kind of a running list of of folks who spill sewer often there's a lot of reason why 
sewer spill despite these valves. Uh, so once you get on that list and get on that radar and, you, you, and you get under a consent decree, you, you want to eliminate any sources of, of potential reportable spills that you might have to say, we still haven't fixed this. And you want to show the EPA, if you're a municipality, that you're being proactive, that you're trying to eliminate these things. Uh, this is one of the tools in the toolbox that they can use to show them, look, you've given us this amount of money or you've authorized this amount of spend or we've taken this out of our own coffers to address environmental issues. Please take us off your radar. Mm. Um, I don't know that there's data on the amount, like mm. in terms of gallons that are spilled. But there's definitely like frequent frequent flyers on the EPA's list that want to get off of that list. Yeah. And is Fort Lauderdale one of them? <clears throat> because my friend Jeff Maggio, the Lunker Dog, he's constantly talking about sewage in Fort Lauderdale and the, the big problem. Do you are you familiar with that that issue? You know, I know that um they were under consent decree years ago and they had a big program to overhaul their entire system. I would think that they've worked their way out of it, but I don't, I'm not intimately familiar with their program. Not according to, not according to a lot of the fishermen up there that, that that's not, <clears throat> it hasn't been, it hasn't been fixed. I mean, I would think that that might be a good target for, for, for your valve um, <clears throat> at some point, but uh, yeah, Jeff is, is, is constantly talking to representatives and talking on his podcast about, about the sewage issue in, in Fort Lauderdale. It's a significant issue um up there so well, i'll tell you go ahead um the the monitoring of these valves is really just the tip of the iceberg we've done some really cool projects with the fish hatcheries where we'll monitor dissolved oxygen in their in their uh um, huh. hatchling ponds because the the hatchlings won't survive except unless the oxygen is in a perfect range if it gets too high they die if it gets too low they die so we can put a dissolved oxygen sensor with the same technology for running that facility. Hey, the oxygen's getting low. You need to turn the aerators on. Or we can just fire a, a command right to the aerators and turn them on and keep that balance right. like it's supposed to be. <clears throat> and so that is, is that, a, 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 is that the actual valve that we were talking about? Or is that another piece that, that your company has, this, this, this monitor? So we don't sell the valve itself. There's those are already in the system. We sell the monitor oh. that attaches to that. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. And make sure that the valve is operating correctly. Yeah. And then the other uses are like what you talked about with the with the fish hatchery. What other what other uses have you come up with? Donnie, what's some other cool ones that we've done, man? Well, we've actually done uh H2S monitoring on uh, you know, as far as like frac sites, welding sites, confined spaces. Uh, oxygen and methane, things like that. <clears throat> and um, beyond the uh, beyond that, we've been in the spill prevention technology for a long, long time. And mainly that type of spill is saltwater tanks in the oil and gas industry. Hmm. That is a, you know, even though that is a resource pulled out of the ground or a byproduct of the oil and gas extraction, um, Salt water is very, very damaging to the environment. Uh, the, the brine that comes out of that can be so concentrated, it would literally kill miles and miles and miles of trees and, and vegetation once it enters a creek. So we've specialized in spill prevention technology from the get-go. And so what, and what would that be? <laughs> what, what is spill prevention technology? Well, what, what we do is we monitor these tanks. We monitor critical high levels in these tanks. Um, in the event that that tank is starting to become compromised, mm -hmm. maybe overflowing or, 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 or other types of uh, reasons, we then can kill one or a thousand different assets mechanically that are sending those process fluids to that tank battery. So let's say you have a group of wells that are pumping oil and production fluids to that tank battery where the separation takes place. If that tank gets too full, well, somebody needs to know about it. It's inevitable that it would spill. The only way to stop that spill is to stop the production fluids from entering there any longer. <clears throat> and that's that's what we've done. And, you know, we've, we've had systems out there that have been out there six and seven years uh, status uptime and 
they don't fail. So we've got a very, very good track record on that. Wow. That's awesome. <clears throat> and certainly, man, to, to avoid catastrophic environmental damage. I mean, that's, that's what everybody wants. It's not good for the environment. Obviously it's not good for the company that does it. Obviously that could be the end of that company, right? Like <clears throat> that's Absolutely. it. But, but even more importantly, that's the end of that Creek and the end of all the wildlife that's there and maybe a long process of, of rehabilitation to get it <clears throat> even to hold life again like that that's super important so good good thing that you're that you're down that road um as far as the you know the the little closer to home the 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 keys um what do you think that the the future of this is is for the keys will it will you continue to to put them throughout all of the keys or like are, is that the process that you're in right now <clears throat> the gentleman that we just that we were working with uh, recently left. Uh, my hope is that they're going to continue to outfit the rest of the bridges. They've done, I think, twenty six bridges now in the lower keys. Hopefully, they they continue to move up. They they see the value in, in getting these alerts and being able to prevent any kind of um, event like that. But also, just to it, it it makes it easier for their maintenance guys to schedule to prioritize and schedule where they need to go. So we, we hope that uh, it catches on. It's starting to catch on in, in some of the bigger cities around Florida or uh, Orlando, JEA, Luxahatchee River District. There's a lot of folks who've started to use these and are seeing the value. So we, uh, we just continue to get the word out. It's, it's a slow process, but um, we're getting there. And we, we'd like to, uh, at the end of this year, and just as a show of support to captains for clean water, if we can, Whatever we sell starting on March 1st through the end of the year, we'd like to kick a donation over to clean water. Nice. Um, for those for those units sold. That's awesome. <clears throat> I mean, those units, that's that's a, a, a massive or it could potentially be a, 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 a big difference in the in the water quality. Um, are you doing the 10,000 push up challenge? Yes, I am. You are, Donnie. <laughs> I've got a team though. I did. I did. Uh, I did do the team route instead of individual. Donnie's on my team. Donnie's on your team. All right. You guys a little sore. It's like day three. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, for the misunderstanding part of this ten thousand push up challenge, which I'm a big part of, um, I was thinking that we were having to do three hundred and fifty a day each member. Yeah. Well, so the very first day, I'm at a oil tank battery out there in the you know middle of the field and rich said you know be sure and film yourself when you're doing these this is you know proof so i get out there and you know i had to start that morning because i had about eight hours of driving and working to do so i did 350 the first day <laughs> and i can't take my hat off right now or you know <laughs> or raise my arms above my waist so but yeah that's now that i know it's 100 it's a it's very doable for me. Yeah. So. Nice. Nice. Well, you can do it as an individual if you want. Um, lots of people <laughs> do, but the team thing is, is new this year. You should get your, um, your, uh, you should propose it to your, your, your alumni group of your, of the event that you just did. seems like it'd be right up their alley. So two of the guys that I graduated with are mm -hmm. on our team. It's me and oh, good. two of my modern day night brothers. And we're at uh, 1675 pushups at this moment right now as a team right on so, yeah sounds great man well well good thing that you're in that so um what have you been able to 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 use that as as a way like did you use that as a way to explain kind of what the whole purpose of this thing is to your to your team and was that accepted well like i'm just wondering if it's working like this is the first year we've ever done anything like this where where we we do the 10,000 push up challenge as some sort of a uh, a cause that's bigger than just, you know, make, seeing if you can do 357 pushups a day for 30 days. So I'm just kind of wondering, like, in your experience, did that open the dialogue to, to water talk? You know, it did. Uh, I'm not a big social media guy. At least I wasn't before I went through the project. I just, if you look at my social media pages, they're brand new. I've got like nine posts, right? Yeah. But I put it, started putting it out there and a lot of the modern day night graduates, we all follow each other and a few of them are actually moving to Florida. So I've gotten six or seven phone calls from guys that are saying, I didn't know there was water quality issues in South Florida. What's going on? I just bought a house in Cocoa beach. Like, 
can you educate me as to what's going on? So I'll send them the links to, to the different organizations and the different um, social media posts. And I'll, I'll explain what I know about it to them. So it has created an awareness, at least in my small circle of people that really had no idea. Yeah. And, and that's, the guys that are doing pushups with us, they're from Arizona and Maryland and they had no idea about our water quality issues down here, but they, they freely jumped in to help us. Help yeah, well, that's why it's also good, I think, to make sure that everybody gets registered because then you get the the official kind of captain's uh, newsletter that comes out and their their email list and keeps everybody up to date on on whatever. And you know, the whole idea is that it doesn't matter if you're in Arizona or whatever. Like the the water quality issues in Arizona are important to me wherever I live, right? Like that that. That's right. You know, you don't want Las Vegas diverting every drop of water. That's not going to be good for anything but Las Vegas and the rest of the state and the rest of the whole West is going to not be doing so well. So, I mean, that's important to me living in, in any state, as it should be important to somebody that lives in, in Arizona that might come to Florida once in the rest of their life that, that the, you know, they might want to go to the beach and they would want it to be nice and pretty and, and smell good and have lots of fish around. And that's, that's kind of the whole idea is that it, it really doesn't matter where you live. It should be important to, it's, it's our, it's everybody's backyard, right? Like that's, that's the whole, the whole kind of idea. But I just kind of wonder, cause I, I have talked to a number of people that, that have said that, yeah, man, it opened up a lot of conversations and, and, and that was, that's good. Cause that's the whole point, but it's also fun to do 10,000 pushups. I mean, I think that's it's right. fun. Not everybody <laughs> thinks it's fun, um, but it, it is something. Donnie, you're that, not going to get you're not going to get any sympathy, Donnie, from Tom because he does. He's doing the ten thousand by himself, not a team. <laughs> well, oh, well uh, no, I, that's, I admire you very much because uh, I, I used to probably ten years ago. I'm fifty five. I probably could have done three fifty a day, no problem. But right now, I'm kind of struggling. I, I still get good form now, Tom. You'll you gotta, you'll you do you'll do, you'll do great. Uh, fifty five. I'm fifty three, so you'll you'll do great. You, I have. You're an oil worker. I'm pretty sure you can do a lot, bunch of push ups. Oh, oh yeah, I do. There's there's a toughness there that that an oil oil field worker has that I think you're going to be able to muscle your way through. Absolutely. And <laughs> to, to to elaborate a little bit more, you know when when Rich went through this uh, project, after he come back after that 75 hours, you know, I'm, I'm part of his team on the, on the work side. And I immediately could see a difference hmm. in him, uh, his attitude, the way he directed the team, you know, I mean, it, it was, it was really refreshing to see that because really? he was, he would, he was in a, he was in a sort of a, a low spot, you know, and it, you know, his low spot is most people's highs, but, you know, ever since he's completed that project, it's been, it's, it's been, it's actually been helpful to me hmm. on, a, on a personal level. And so, you know, so what do you think, what do you think was the most helpful? Were his, were his directives clearer or had more meaning or was he communicating better or like what, what, when well, you say you saw a difference immediately, yeah. like specifically, what do you think was, was going on there? You know, he's always been a, a good leader. I mean, he was always good at, here's what we're doing. Here's our timeline, but it seemed to put purpose behind it. He, he made, he made you feel more like a team than rather just somebody that's being led you know, and, and, and that, that's where I could see the difference. I mean, I could literally see the difference from when he left to then, because, you know, Rich has always included me in everything, but he, when, when you, when you can take a group of people and make them believe in themselves, believe in what we're doing, our vision, and make them feel like this is just as much me, you know, sort of like don't, no one left behind. Right. And, right. and he wasn't going to do it. You know, he would carry us off. But just that, just yes. seeing that was 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 huge and very evident when he come back. So. Have you told him that bef before this minute? Not really. No, he, he keeps me busy working. You know. <laughs> <laughs> did you realize that that you that Rich, did you realize that that the, the outward um, leadership had immediately changed and that, that the people around you were noticing? That's the, that's the first acknowledgement that I've gotten from my team. So Donnie, thank you very much, man. That's, <laughs> that's really awesome. It's leadership was a huge focus in this thing. And 
they would put you in a leadership position that they knew was very difficult to see how you failed and then what you did about it. And uh, I definitely left there with some tools that the that people in the military use to clarify the message, simplify the message, get everybody involved as a team, don't throw each other uh, other on each other under the bus and that type of thing. So I've been trying really hard to implement that in practice. I'm, I'm I, thank you, Donnie. I'm glad it's being noticed. Yeah, no, and, and, and it is. I mean, it, it was, you know, and I told Rich this self, I was like, man, I want to, I want to do that project. I want to do, you know, I really do even just for the tattoo, you know, I mean, I just think that's <laughs> cool, but um, you know, and I followed all the guys after Rich went through this, I started following everybody, Ray and all of them. And, you know, and just just seeing what what that program is about, this world needs that so bad. Yeah, uh, on so many levels, you know, from the family to the business to your personal life to to everything. And you know, just seeing Rich come back, I mean, it it gave me drive within our team to do our business. You know, and I mean that that's that's very inspirational to see that happen. You know. And that's got to be the best testimonial ever. Like, especially when you haven't heard that before and you're hearing it from, from your direct team. Um, some similar things happened when I came back from, from seal fit, um, that I didn't even realize were being noticed. And then lessons, I mean, you'll, you'll continue learning lessons from, from, from this experience that you've had. And as your life, as your life changes, you know, you, you start to, to see changes in your life. I don't know, different things happen with, with, with just the evolution of life and you're just going through. And then all of a sudden you're like, Oh yeah, I've already learned this. I already knew this from, from this experience that I had. The biggest takeaway that I, that I had, um, you, we were, you were talking about, um, wanting to talk about Kokoro and, and selection and we briefly talked about it before, but you know, for those that don't know what those are, um, Seal Fit Kokoro is designed to be a 50-hour snapshot of the Navy SEALs Hell Week. It's not not the whole thing. You're not doing what they do for the whole thing. It's much their their experience is much longer, but it's just a snapshot of 50 hours of something that would be similar to a Bud's training, right? And you go, there are real Navy SEALs there and they've all been through BUDS and they put you through the same thing that they went through for 50 hours and teach these leadership um, uh, skills. And you're encouraged to work together as a team and you're encouraged to help each other and you're encouraged to um, really to well, those two things really to really help the person that's next to you and also to work together as a team. And to, if you do those things, well, you will not have a problem. Everything will be fine. You will make it through the physical, even if you're not prepared because your friend's going to help you out. If you literally cannot stand up, the two people on either side of you will pick you up and carry you across the, the line and you will make it through that evolution evolution. Now, the the go ruck selection was exactly the opposite and you couldn't talk to anyone you could not help anyone if you fell down and anyone helped you they got in trouble and it was it was a very very different experience and so when i came away from seal fit i realized the importance of a team and i realized that i can do way more as a team and to go back, and I had a similar experience that, as you do, of I'm going to really work on my leadership skills. I'm going to really work on my team. And I realize how important a team is. That's what I thought. But as then you go through this next evolution of life and you go through another experience where I did not pass the, the, the Go Ruck selection. I made it about 20 hours into that, into a 48-hour event. And realize that, wow, it is way, way harder to try to do anything by yourself. And wow. what I thought I learned in Seal Fit of the importance of a team, I was still noticing that I would come back and I'd try to lone wolf it. And I'd try to do things myself and, 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 and not, you know, not 
necessarily do the team as much. And the team can be your business. The team can be your family. The team can be your friends. The team can be anybody that you are around or you're trying to accomplish anything with. The, the, the people that you fish with, the people that you talk to at the dock, whatever. You can be a lone wolf or you can be a team or you can be a part-time team member. And I was thinking I was kind of being a part-time team member in, in all of those places. Well, then you go to to go ruck selection and fail at a level that is like a, a full on beat down to where your body just stops. And you, I came away from that realizing, wow, I thought I knew the value of a team, but until you really get humbled and until you really get, you know, you go away with your tail between your legs, you don't realize that, the importance of the team and the and 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 where you look to for your team like your family your wife your parents your children all of those people are on your team all of your business people are on your team and how you how you lead those people and how you interact with those people can be the difference between massive success and massive failure and and it was just that lesson it was like i needed to learn that lesson and boy, did the universe hand it to me in the form of uh, a bunch of green berets that were um, going to make sure that, <laughs> that 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 I was up to the standard, which I ultimately wasn't. Um, but as a team, it was way easier. And it wasn't like Seal Fit Kokoro was that much harder than what they were asking us to do in in selection. In fact, selection was a little harder than than Kokoro, but. The difference of having people help you and you helping other people and you all working towards a similar goal made the whole experience way easier. And then you take that back and you apply that to life exactly. And man, yeah. it's like then then your business takes off, then your family takes off, then then your I mean, whatever, your golf group takes off, whatever it is. Everything is everything has changed. And it's it's really cool to hear that that you had that experience and that that it's being reflected in in the people that you work with. That's 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 super awesome. Yeah, that I tell you that the team component in modern day night project is huge. Ray Cash Carey, he was Navy SEAL. Like they're mm -hmm. all about the teams, right? Yeah. Steve Eckert is another one of the coaches there, Bedros, and a big part of their message is you're going to level up on family, fitness, finances, and faith. Your fitness is your foundation of who you are as a man and how strong you are and what you represent to the world. Your family's probably getting neglected because of the stresses of life. You know, your finances, everybody needs to have different streams of income. They go into some classroom training and stuff about that. But it's interesting what you said about the lesson really came home to you when you didn't make the go ruck. There's little wins and failures within that 75 hour experience of the project that really drive those lessons home. And if you're going to make it through the end of that, you, you've got to pick up on that lesson within the next 12 hours when that thing circles back around again. And you got to know that you have to rely on your team. If you're an individual, and you're in better or worse shape than everybody else, and you and you you push your team too hard, or you don't push them hard enough because you you don't speak up enough. All of that's going to come out because of the amount of stress that you're under in these 75 hours. And it, the great thing about it is you get a chance to address it right there, learn from it from some guys who are really fantastic trainers. I mean, I still get on a phone call once a week with Steve Eckert, one of the <laughs> other coaches in the in the thing, and. He coaches me through different things, business challenges, personal challenges. And one of the things he really drove home to, uh, to your point is he pulled up my calendar. He said well, he wanted to see what my cal calendar discipline was like. He's like, it's all business meetings. Where's date night with your wife? Where's social time? When are you going to call your mom? You know, is your business more important than your wife? No, sir, it's not. <laughs> well, then why isn't she on your calendar? And just just simple little revelations like that. So you make them a priority, just like everything else in your life. It was nice. another big takeaway for us. Man, that's huge. And, and when you, when you, when you see a, like to Donnie's point of how, how much this is needed in today's society, it's lots of people thrive in, in certain parts of their life, but they, they, they neglect other parts of their life. And, and to, to, to try to um, have the discipline, that's really what it is. It's really the discipline to, make time, write it down, schedule it. And then, then it happens, you know, I mean, that, that absolutely happens as opposed to just kind of drifting and flying by the seat of your pants and, 
and hoping something's going to happen. Um, another big takeaway, wonder what you think about this is um, from the seal fit one was in order to be an exceptional leader, you also had to learn how to be an exceptional follower. That was one of my first big takeaways. When I look back on the notes, um, like I, I spent, well, I spent the whole flight home from uh, California asleep, um, <laughs> literally knocked out. I, 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 we got finished with that camp and I made the mistake of leaving the next day. And I, I got on the plane and sat down next to this sweet lady. And I said, uh, ma'am, I'm not on drugs. I am not drunk, but I'm going to pass out here. And I have a flight when we land. Will you please make sure that I'm awake? And this is like a four hour flight. Like, like, will you please make sure that I'm awake before you get off the plane? And immediately she said, oh, yes, that's fine. And I just boom. And I was I've never had an experience like that to where I literally woke up and everyone is leaving the plane. And I was completely unconscious because of not no sleep for for 40 or 50 hours and and uh then maybe a couple of hours that night but um after that i spent a lot of time on the journal and spending time um like thinking about what what are the lessons that i learned from this and it's funny to look back on them the, the immediate takeaways from it were different than maybe the takeaways that i have now but that was that was one of the first ones is that if you're going to be a great leader, you also have to be a great follower, meaning that if you're going to if you're going to put somebody else in charge of something, then you have to be the number one cheerleader for their success. And you have to you know, you can't you you want to you want to be the best follower of that person. Otherwise, they're not getting it done. Right. And and so did you experience something similar in your in your event? hundred percent. That was one of the major lessons. Everybody gets a turn to be a leader on your team and you get to see how people, I can tell you, I've met a lot of people in corporate America who think they know how to be great leaders and would never be a, a good follower. And because of that, they, that it just doesn't come through, right? It's, it's hard to be led by people who won't, who you don't believe won't do what you're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. so that was, that was a huge lesson for us. You know, what's interesting too, is uh, you mentioned the journaling. I had never journaled in my life prior to that. And to hear that these really tough dudes that you look up to and respect, and you're pretty sure they could beat the crap out of you in about three seconds <laughs> to hear that they journal every day kind of was like, okay. Cause you know, at my house, if I told somebody I was journaling as a kid, they, you know, probably make fun of me for being a sissy or something. So to, to hear that these guys are journaling and getting those thoughts out was a big one for me. Cause now I do that not every day, but three or four times a week. I'll journal some struggle I'm having or some victory that I'm having. And I can refer back to that. And then when Steve and I are talking, I can, I can pull that up and I can say, this is a challenge. This is how I dealt with it. I felt like I did okay, but I could have done better. So that, that journaling thing is, is new for me since the project. And, and I found it to be pretty helpful. That's awesome, man. So, so how are you going to take all of these lessons and this experience and, and, uh, and, and turn it into um, cleaning up the water and making or, or protecting the water uh, for generations to come through your through your your technology and what you have. What's the well, what's the blue sky for the next five years? <clears throat> so one of the things they did teach us in the project is when you have a goal that seems overwhelming, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Right. Mm -hmm. so if we can just do our small part. If we can focus on the mission that we have at hand and make sure that the, the small piece of the world that we have influence on, if we can clean up the environment and specifically the waterways with the, the, the parts that, that we're able to touch and be really proficient at, that's a big deal in and of itself. But it also sets an example for other companies to try to do similar things, right? We're leading by example and trying to persuade other people to get involved and do things. Wow. That's awesome, man. Well, I hope. Uh... I hope it's super successful for you and your success is, is all of our success. Like if you, if you can sell this to, to every municipality across the country, then that's a win for everybody because it keeps the, keeps the, the bad stuff out of the water. And um, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Right. That's right. Hey, if you got a minute, I want to check, I want to check, talk to you about boats. Okay. I'm getting my first, I've, I've dreamt about having a yellowfin 24 bay boat for, probably 15 years. And I always convinced myself that 
that money could be spent in some better way. And now that I'm, now that I'm getting older and there's less years left at the end of this thing, I'm like, you know what? Now is the time I'm finally pulling the trigger. Now's it. the time. So I got Good for you, money. man. Congratulations. That's a hell of a boat and you're not going to be disappointed. Yeah. I got the carbon fiber version and picking up February 20th. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. What color did you get? I'll be down there to help. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. You come. What color did you get? Uh, it's a cool, it's a cool whisper gray color. Uh-huh. I've seen one of those yeah. before. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what the color of my all my boats are. Whisper gray. And and do you have black hardware? Uh like, the, like the, yeah, there's there's the tower. Yeah. Did you get a tower? No tower. Okay. No cool. tower. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good for going under the bridges. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go so what else did you get on it? Did you, did you, how'd you rig it out? I bought it used, so I, I okay. didn't rig it out. I didn't build it, but, um, it's got Simrad twin 10 foot power poles in the back, Barado 350, um, and trolling motor, of course. That's nice. pretty much it. Pretty simple. Yeah, yeah man. Well, you're going to love it. It's going to be fantastic. And, uh, and what a boat for the keys, man. That, that boat is, um, uh, that's my favorite boat. It is the most versatile boat, although we've been fishing out of the 26 now, and the 26 is also quite versatile. So between the 24 and the 26, it's really uh, uh, kind of a, a crapshoot on, is it more versatile? The 26 might be more versatile if you really like going offshore, right? Like if you like to fish on the reef, you're going to be able to do that more out of the 26 than you are on the 24, more, more weather days. It's, it's going to be able to handle the reef on, on some days where the bay boat might not be as, as fun or nice, or, or maybe you just wouldn't want to do that. But if you gravitate towards the inshore side, then the 24 is, is more, more versatile than the 26, even though we filmed a bonefish show out of the 26. Um, so, I mean, both boats are really incredible, but you're going to, you're going to love that 24, man. That's, that's a really, really great boat for, for what you're going to be in the areas that you're going to be in. Yeah. I'm uh, we, I went on before the pandemic me and a group of guys from Jackson hole went to Belize and did a permit fishing trip. And I was not a permit guy or a fly fishing guy. Really. I was a spin and ride guy yeah. prior to that trip, but man, I saw the light when we were down in Belize throwing flies at permit. Now I'm, I'm hooked. So we, I've got a, I've got a little 18 foot beaver tail that I use for the real skinny stuff. And then, you know, if I want to run out and catch mutton, go to the reef on a pretty day, I've got the, I'll have the bay for that. So I'm excited, man. Yeah, that's great. And who are the guys from Jackson hole that, you know, uh, my business partner moved up there a few years ago and it's just a circle of, of, of locals that he's met since he's lived there for the past four years. That's cool, man. Well, that's where I started my guide career right in Jackson and, um, guided there for seven years. Yeah. Mostly on the South Fork of the Snake River over on the other side of the hill, but Jackson's another place close to my heart. Love that place. Yeah, you talk about beautiful country. I've been up there a handful of times and visit. It's got to be one of the most beautiful places I've seen. I, I, I agree, man. I agree. Jackson is Jackson is uh is fantastic. The other side of the hill, the Victor Driggs uh Tetonia area, that's all really nice. And and just that two hundred mile radius around Yellowstone National Park. I mean, just just Go 200 miles outside of Yellowstone National Park in any direction. You've got what, in my opinion, is is the is the prime country in you know in the in the Western United States for the for the United States. I mean, the best fishing. The I mean, there's not to say that there's not good fishing all, uh, other places, but there's just a lot of really great stuff there. It's it's an amazing place. Yeah, beautiful country. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, guys, I appreciate you coming on the podcast today. And it was unexpected to talk about the MDK project. That's that's fantastic. I'm really glad that you went there. And, and, and uh, you're the first person that I've talked to that's that's completed that course. So that's uh, that's really cool. But I've been very curious about it. Maybe you can hook me up with Ray Kerr. Love to have him on the podcast one day. Um, that would be, that would be fantastic. I've had some of my own Kokoro instructors on the podcast and, and also, um, well, none of the none of the go rock guys yet, but uh, I've I've kept in touch with a lot of the the um, the seal fit guys, and um, it, that was that was fantastic. Um, but anyway, Donnie, thank you, appreciate it, man. Sure. So, if anybody wants to learn more about this 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 your company and the 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 monitoring, and is it do you have a website or any place where people can read about what you do or see it in action? Yep. Our website is rain, like R E I G N, rain over your domain, rainrmc.com. 
RMST stands for Remote Monitor Control. And if anybody wants, is curious and wants to talk to us, they can call us at 833-GO-RAIN. And we, there's an article about our product that's floating around the internet on Water and Sewer Magazine, which I'm sure is not on everybody's desk. Oh, man, that's what I get that every week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed your article, but I do get that. I'm a, I'm a subscriber, longtime subscriber of Water and Sewer yeah. Magazine. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I hope you have an awesome day. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll be back with another guest next week. All right. See ya.